Hello everyone, thank you for coming. We're just waiting for a couple more people to get signed on. So we're just gonna wait a minute or so and then we'll get started. But if you have any questions straight off, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll be using the chat throughout the talk for you to put questions in. Um, and then hopefully at the end, we'll have time to come and answer some of those questions for you. Um, welcome and I'm really glad you could all make it. Okay, I think we're all just about here now. So I'll say welcome again to the first in our little mini series of talks about our new work in West Cumbria focused on sustainable fishing um, in the fishing communities around Whitehaven. Um, so I'll start with a little introduction to ourselves. Unfortunately, Emily wasn't able to join us this week. She's very, very busy. Um, but Emily is the Senior Marine Conservation Officer for Cumbria Wildlife Trust. And she's the overall kind of visionary for both of the projects we'll be talking about today, which are the Cumbria and Creel Project and My Local Catch. Um, as for me, I'm the Project Officer for My Local Catch, which is a uh, marine awareness project based in Whitehaven. And I'm Lucy. Hello. Hi, I'm Harry and I'm the Marine Futures intern uh, based in Cumbria. So I work for four partners, uh, the Cumbria Wildlife Trust, Orsted, Natural England, and uh, um, it's funded by the Crown Estate. Um, yeah, so that's me. So the projects we're going to be talking about are um, kind of linked but separate. So the first is the Cumbrian Creel Project. And this is a research project into sustainable fishing where we'll be working with three amazing local fishermen um, to, help them to, to help them to support the development of sustainable creel fishing for nephrops or langoustine or scampi or whatever you might know them as, um, as a kind of sustainable element to their business and a way to help mitigate some of the impacts of, um, you know, the changes to fish stocks and fuel prices and all kinds of other things. And then the other project is My Local Catch, which is a marine awareness project. Uh, we're based in Whitehaven and we work with schools, youth groups, restaurants and businesses, um, local chefs, all kinds of different elements of the community to help them to engage with their kind of local cultural heritage in terms of our fishing history um, and kind of cultural fishing practices and also our incredible local natural heritage in terms of the amazing like muddy undersea landscapes we have off the coast of Cumbria. Um, so that project's really all about promoting sustainable seafood and sustainable fishing as a way to help the recovery of the seas and helping local people to get engaged with um, the seafood in their area. So I'll start things off with a little bit of a kind of history of Cumbrian fishing. Um, so as far back as you can kind of find, Whitehaven was a small fishing village. It was on the coast. People would rely on the sea for their subsistence. And it's got this really, really strong kind of cultural heritage of fishing there. 
From around 1633, um, a harbour was built in Whitehaven to help the exports of salt and coal primarily to Ireland. Um, but over the next 200 years, there was sort of a steadily increasing investment and industry in Whitehaven to the extent that at one point it was one of the most commercially important ports in England. Um, and it played a really key role in loads of kind of global trade. Um, so it was sort of building up as a, a more and more industrious area. Um, and around that time in 1820, trawl fishing began in the Irish Sea, which is a method of fishing we'll talk about a bit more later, but it's much larger scale than the sort of traditional small guy in a boat with a net. Um, and that meant that fishing could be done on a much larger scale, which meant um, it sort of really grew as an industry, but that also had lots of knock-on effects for things like the fish stocks and the health of the marine ecosystems. So in 1950, many of the fish stocks in the Irish Sea collapsed. Um, they just fell completely below fishable levels. And this was largely due to overfishing. We were taking too much of the fish and there wasn't enough left to maintain a stable population. Um, and what this meant was that lots of fishermen ended up fishing what we call down the food chain, which is where rather than fishing for um, the sort of larger fish, they end up fishing for things like shellfish um, because they're sort of the bottom trophic level or energy level of the food chain. Um, and when the other species have disappeared, they're still there. So this is when the fishing for nephrops or scampi, which we'll be talking about quite a lot, really started to increase. And I think this sort of coincided with some very clever person deciding to breadcrumb it and start selling it in pubs. So as the fishing for nephrops increased, so did the demand um, for scampi. Um, and this sort of carried on relatively unchanged until 2019 when trawl fishing was banned in west of Walney Marine Conservation Zone. And in a lot of ways, this is a fantastic thing for conservation. Um, conservation zones are really important for protecting marine habitats and also for helping to keep those fish stocks stable because by having a kind of area where the fish are safe from fishing, um, that means that the population there kind of stays stable and grows and the spillover effects into the nearby waters. Um, but the immediate effects of that are that the areas which fishermen could previously fish has reduced. Um, and that obviously has economic impacts for the local fishing community. So one of the things which um, the Cumbrian Creole project was trying to address was that kind of economic insecurity of the sort of changes to fish stocks and increased other costs like fuel costs um, by helping to develop a method which was kind of sustainable, non-damaging to marine ecosystems and which could still be done in this area and in other areas where um, we didn't want to do trawling. And then just to add another layer to the whole complexity of it, in 2020, um, shellfish exports started being really hindered by Brexit and there were lots of kind of different regulations which shellfish exports now had to meet, which just adds another layer of kind of difficulty for small local fishermen trying to run their business. Um, so what's the bigger picture of this? Unsustainable fishing is an enormous global issue. It's one of the biggest threats to our marine ecosystems. And it's one of the biggest reasons for the loss of the kind of higher trophic level predator species like dolphins and sharks and tuna. Um, the more we overfish, the more those kind of creatures are unable to be supported. Um, so trying to move towards a model for sustainable fishing is really, really important for marine conservation, but also for kind of our ecosystems and economy and local communities as well. Um, so in the UK, two thirds of our fish populations are overfished and only around 30 percent are healthy size and are actively managed. And that is a really quite a stark statistic if you compare that to maybe you know, 50, 100 years ago when the UK really relied on seafood for an enormous amount of our um, of our food and of our income. Um, and if people aren't eating fish, then we end up eating other things such as like intensively farmed 
vegetables or meat and dairy, all of which we know also have a really high environmental impact. So it's not so simple as just stopping fishing. Um, 70% of the fish consumed in the UK is imported and 80% of the fish caught in the UK is exported. So as I mentioned earlier with Brexit, this creates a really difficult kind of gap in what we're catching versus what we're eating and creates a really unsustainable kind of food system where um, there's lots of food miles, there's lots of insecurity and lots of waste because of those big distances traveling. So the big things when we're moving towards a more sustainable future for fishing are trying to keep it more local, catch more, um, sell more of what we catch locally, um, keeping it down at sustainable levels and using those kind of selective methods which won't be as damaging. So Harry's gonna take you through a little bit more about the methods that we're talking about. Trawling. Well, trawling is large, where large weighted nets are dragged along the seafloor and they essentially catch pretty much everything in their path and they can be extremely large, these nets. Um, around a quarter of global seafood is caught by bottom trawling. So it's a huge, huge industry and it's very economically important uh, in terms of the fishing industry. Um, so what are some sort of some of the, the negative impacts of trawling? Well, one of the main ones is bycatch. And this is where fish and other marine species are caught unintentionally. Obviously, if you're dragging a net along the sea floor, it, it's not very selective. You can't choose what's going to end up in your net. Um, and 40% of fish caught worldwide is bycatch. So it's an absolutely massive issue. Um, and bycatch is usually thrown back into the sea um, once it's caught, whether the, the animals are, are dead or injured. Um, yeah, and this can really disrupt the food chain for other species. Uh, so fish or species that rely on um, some of these fish that have been caught through bycatch uh, might not do quite as well because their food essentially has been taken out of the, uh, of the sea. So another negative of trawling is habitat destruction. Um, obviously, trawling is, a, it is an extremely disruptive destructive uh, fishing method. Uh, you're just dragging um, nets along the seafloor in most cases, and um, it is potentially the most habitat damaging activity undertaken uh, in the UK, in UK waters, sorry. Um, yeah, so it results in a loss of benthic habitat, and the benthic habitat is uh, habitats that are on the seafloor, and this can again sort of feed into the food chain uh, if, if those habitats are starting to be lost then uh, other animals are gonna struggle to survive because uh, their food is gonna be less abundant. Uh, specifically in the Irish Sea, we have a really uh, muddy habitat there on the seafloor and uh, trawling actually disrupts the sediment layer so that oxygen can't get to areas in which it would usually go. And that means that sort of burrowing, um, burrowing animals aren't able to survive in, in the habitats that they usually would. Uh, when trawling was not happening. So another really big impact of trawling that isn't sort of massively common knowledge is that um, trawling actually contributes to a large amount of carbon release. And this is because trawling churns up the C4 sediment, which releases carbon in turn. And uh, globally, trawling actually releases around one gigaton of carbon every year, which is more than the annual carbon emissions uh, created through the aviation industry. So this is a huge, huge area and it's very current at the moment, especially since the UK government's you know, re recently uh, announced that they want to be uh, carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, so you know, there's a lot of uh, emphasis on renewable power and clean energy and things like that. Uh, but you know, fishing is also a really big carbon contributor and one that needs to be looked into. So how is creel fishing different to large scale trawl fishing? Well, creeling is a passive fishing method and it uses creels or, or pots to catch crustaceans that are on the seabed. So creeling is uses static pots um, 
and this means that creels are dropped onto from the boat onto the seabed and um, they sit on the seabed they don't move around and um, when they're on the seafloor they don't damage any local habitats or anything like that um, the pots are left there and uh, over time animals are attracted to the bait within the pots and um, then they're retrieved at a later date and it's a really low impact method of fishing due to the relatively small footprint of the uh, the creel pots so creeling is also a very selective method of fishing um, this means that when we pull the pots out of the water we can um, select the species the uh, individuals that we want to take so juveniles and pregnant females will, can be thrown back uh, in order to maintain a healthy population of where, whatever you're trying to catch. Um, bycatch is reduced significantly. Uh, there is a tiny negligible amount of bycatch, but almost nothing. Um, and any bycatch that is caught alive can be returned unharmed to the sea. Uh, so yeah, only the largest, healthiest individuals are taken, uh, which means that you get the biggest ones, the healthiest ones, they're not damaged through trawling or anything like that. So you've got a bit of a premium product and you can sell that for much, much more. Um, yeah, to like high end restaurants, things like that. Um, yeah, so also creeling is a very small scale. Um, the boats that make up the inshore creel fisheries are usually less than 10 meters long. Uh, when you compare that to the massive uh, ships that carry out trawling, it's, it's huge. Um, trawlers use about four times more diesel to catch one kilogram of langoustines um, when you compare that to one kilogram caught by uh, a creeling vessel. So four times more, more diesel is, is a lot, especially when you think about the number of vessels that are operating. Um, yeah, so why is creel fishing sustainable? Well, to start with, it protects the seabed from bottom trawling. If we've got creels on the seafloor, that's protecting an area from um, from trawlers. So protecting, you know, important habitats um, on the seabed. Uh, the bycatch, like I said, it's um, negligible bycatch. Um, bycatch for trawl caught net props is 25% of the overall catch. So that's a huge, huge amount of fish that are just going to waste at the end of the day. Um, we're supporting our local small scale fishermen, uh, which is brilliant. These are people who have really struggled recently and um, it's always really good to support these local historic uh, fishermen that have been around for generations. Um, we can also creel within offshore developments such as offshore wind farms. Um, they're sort of the perfect place to promote um, increased biodiversity and we can coexist within there, uh, which is great. So we can generate renewable energy and also catch sustainable fish in the same place. And uh, yeah, finally, we can get a selective higher quality catch, which can be sold for much more um, eventually when, we, uh, when, when they're fished. So I'm just going to talk about um, a case study that was in Lime Bay, uh, which is on the border of Dorset and Devon. Um, so in 2008, there's a marine conservation zone that had 60 square miles closed to trawling. Uh, in 2010, it was actually increased to 90 square miles. And um, that was in order to protect the, the reefs, rare corals and, and sea fans that were located in the uh, marine conservation zone. But because of the, the ban on trawling, there was an increase in um, static gear um, like we've been talking about, things like lobster pots, uh, creeling, things like that. There's a huge increase. And because of that, the fish stocks actually diminished. Um, they went down. So in 2013, the Blue Marine Foundation set up management um, of the marine conservation zone. And that they included a voluntary code of conduct for the fishermen, uh, which included restricting the amount of pots and nets uh, to agreed levels. Um, in order to sort of benefit everybody and as a result of that they saw a hu huge increases in uh, in species numbers and it just goes to show that um, we do need to manage these areas correctly you know just getting rid of one thing and, and 
putting another thing in its place doesn't always work. So correct management is always needed. But um, yeah, so these are just some of the stats from the Lime Bay um, Conservation Zone uh, that were found by the University of Plymouth. Uh, so they've got 32 fishing boats that are currently um, sort of abiding by this voluntary code of conduct. And um, they've got 206 square kilometers protected of, from trawling. And they've had four times more flora and fauna since the uh, project kicked off, and an 84% increase in species. Um, further to that, they've got four and a half more juvenile lobsters, which is brilliant for the fishermen because uh, they're going to grow and eventually be a really commercially viable option for them, and seven times more scallops, and also seven times more pink sea fans, which is the reason that the Marine Conservation Zone was implemented in the first place. So yeah, it just goes to show that uh, with good management, uh, you can really see benefits for conservation, but also fishermen at the same time. I'll pass back to Lucy now. <laughs> Turn my camera off instead of my microphone on. Thank you very much, Harry. Um, so one of the really big findings of the Lime Bay study was that the real power in these kind of sustainable fishing projects comes when you work with the fishing community rather than having this kind of top-down management where you just outright ban things. Um, the much more effective method for kind of achieving these marine conservation and biodiversity and recovery gains is working with the fishing community and helping them to um, kind of take ownership of their local marine ecosystem because they're just as invested in um, the importance of those kind of stable and healthy ecosystems as the conservationists are. So we have two linked projects, as I said at the start. Um, one is helping to develop the fishing method and the business side, and one is helping to develop the kind of supply chain and um, community ownership side. Um, so the Cumbrian Creel project is focusing on creel fishing for Dublin Bay prawns. Now, you might know Dublin, Dublin Bay prawns as scampi, as langoustine, as lobsterettes, as um, just prawns, if you're in West Cumbria, I think that's what they're commonly known as. Um, but they're actually related to um, the lobster family. They're quite often known as Norway lobster as well. And they're sort of about this big. They're really sweet. Um, they live in little burrows in the subtidal mud. And as Harry mentioned earlier, they dig burrows into the sediment, which then helps let oxygen into all kinds of other layers um, and lets loads of different wildlife thrive. So they're really, really important as a kind of ecosystem engineer. Um, and also they are one of the most commercially important crustaceans in Europe. They actually started uh, being sold in kind of the pre-1950s as a sort of on the side under the table deal where sailors could make a bit of extra cash from the bycatch of um, scampi but following the collapse of other fish stocks in the 1950s and as I said the development of breaded scampi um, they've really grown in popularity and in, in importance and they're now one of like the main um, fish species certainly in the Irish Sea and um, in lots of other places around Europe. But the issue is that they're usually fished by bottom trawling, which we've discussed already has high levels of bycatch, habitat destruction um, and all kinds of other issues linked to it. Um, they are fished by creeling in certain places, such as up in the sea locks in Scotland. Um, but the concern was always that out in the open sea in the Irish Sea, you just wouldn't be able to do creeling at the kind of scale that you can in the nice sheltered locks because they thought the pots would just get you know, blown away, tangled up, all that kind of thing. So in um, 2019, we carried out a pilot study um, looking into whether this would be feasible um, as a method using these creel pots to fish for langoustine like you would for crab or lobster or other kind of shellfish. Um, so we've got a little video here, which is... Um, sort of about the project, about our relationship with the fishermen that we're working with in Whitehaven and in Barrow, and about what the kind of aims are for the project. Now, it's worth warning you all, um, the video shares very quietly on the screen. So if you want to all turn your volume up and then turn it down again at the end of the video, and I'll speak quite softly at the start so that I don't deafen you all. 
It's a, a project that we've been wanting to do for a long time. Something that we feel is really important because not only are our seas, the important species and habitats that live there being threatened by unsustainable fisheries, but also the livelihoods of coastal fishermen are being threatened because of declines in you know, fish populations and also rising fuel prices and things like that. And the Creel Project is a really great example of how fisheries and conservationists can work together for mutual benefit. A sustainable fishery is a fishery where you're, you're thinking about what you're catching, how much you're catching and how you're doing it. So we're trying to only catch what we need, catch larger individuals that have had a chance to, to breed and reproduce and to catch it in a, a low impact way so we're not damaging the habitats and the other species that live in that area. So when trawlers go out, the nets go in and they sink to the seabed and often multiple nets drag across the seabed, sweeping up everything in their path. But when we use creel pots, they sink to the seabed fairly slowly and they just rest on the surface. So we're working with small scale coastal fishermen in Barrow and Furness and Whitehaven to undertake a project to look at the feasibility of creel fishing for longestines on a commercial scale. And we've been able to show that it does work and we've been able to catch large, high quality prawns that would have a high market value. So now we're looking to develop this project and test it on a, a wider scale. And we're also hoping to work with the local communities to help them understand what's out there in the Irish Sea and what their local catch is. The sustainable fishery is very important because obviously you're looking into the future and if I can catch and return fish at the same time, obviously in the long run it's going to, we're going to benefit, benefit from it. Dolphins, seals, there's all kinds of life. In the pots you get all different types of species like wrasse, lobsters now and again, whelks, you get all different, different types of fish. It's amazing what, what life is out there. The benefits of my catch, with me being a day boat, it's fresh and you can't really, you can't beat that. Obviously my catch is as fresh as possible. It obviously demands, a, in my eyes, it, dem it demands the top, top money for the produce I'm supplying. I'd say the perfect day would be when you get up, mid middle of the summer, you come down, there's not a ripple on the water, and then you head out and you just plod away all day. Whether you catch fish or you don't catch fish, it's just a bonus, it's nice to be out. The pilot project which that video was focusing on took place in 2019 with um, Andy who's an amazing local fisherman in Barrow and as I said before the video is really trying to see whether um, creel fishing in this area would be successful like it has been in other areas um, and the findings really were that it could be as feasible as those other fisheries up in Scotland um, and it could be a really good sustainable way of um, fishing for these species and um, you know having that local fishing economy whilst also protecting the species in the west of Warnley Marine Conservation Zone and in the wider Cumbrian coast area. So um, the kind of statistics from the pilot phase of the project over six to eight fishing trips, there were 298 creels used and of them 340 saleable nephrops were caught. So it depends which way you calculate it, but it works out as sort of one to two or two to three um, nephrops per pot. Um, there's a full report if you want to see all the calculations. We've just got some of the key statistics here. Um, and from the length and the weight, we can see that these are really good, high quality large individuals um, and the thing that that means is that you can catch less fish um, and sell them for a really good price and have that great sustainable business but with almost no waste and with far far lower impact on the marine ecosystems as we discussed. So Andy who took part in the project 
gave us this wonderful quote. He said, it's been really interesting. He thinks it could be a sustainable fishery and he hopes to pursue it in the future, which is really, really promising um, as we go into the next phase of the project where we're hoping to get more fishermen to, doing the, to do this at a commercial scale um, to help develop those kind of sustainable alternatives to trawling within their business. So what's next for creel fishing in Cumbria? Well, the My Local Catch project has just kicked off and this I'll be working in Whitehaven and the surrounding area um, to work with local community groups, school groups, youth groups, restaurants, businesses, suppliers, food festivals, all kinds of different um, elements of the community to really raise awareness about the catch that we have in Cumbria and what um, is kind of our local catch, our local food, um, and how people can try cooking that for themselves rather than the species that are really overfished, like tuna and salmon and cod and prawns, all of which have enormous pressure on them as species and which um, really um, are overfished in a lot of places around the world. So if we can sort of switch to these more sustainable and less commonly eaten species, then that's a big win um, for kind of the overall ecosystem balance. In terms of the next steps for the creel project, we have around 400 creel pots ordered and they should be arriving later this year. And once they've arrived, um, our fishermen will be able to go out and do these commercial creel seasons um, whilst we're simultaneously helping them to develop the markets and the kind of supply chain for their catch. Um, and the idea is that this all form a really great alternative to the um, trawling that would previously have been done and that it'll be able to continue as a part of their business once our project has ended. And then our kind of pie in the sky aim is that we'd like um, sustainable Creole Court Langoustine to become a really classic Cumbrian cuisine in the same way that Herdwick lamb is um, and to really help kind of rebuild that connection with the sea which is so inherent to so many coastal communities and which we've kind of lost over recent decades so honouring that amazing local catch as a part of our kind of cultural heritage would be a really wonderful thing for us to develop in the future. So a rough timeline of um, the project. We are um, hopefully getting the creel pots in September. So if we have quite a calm autumn, we may be able to do some creeling then. Um, but creel fishing is very dependent on the weather. So it may be that it waits until next spring before we get to kind of full scale um, fishing. But we'll have the pots and we'll be able to be developing those methods with the fishermen. Then in June next year, we're hoping to have the support of restaurants and suppliers, and we'll be working with some amazing local chefs and local businesses um, to get them to kind of develop recipes using local Creole Court Langoustine and to really raise the profile of this amazing um, catch in the local community. And then through the summers of 2022 and 2023, there'll be full scale creel fishing seasons, which will hopefully help our fishermen to really um, work out all the kinks, develop exactly what the methods they want to use are and share those findings with the wider fishing community, which is obviously something we'll be facilitating and supporting. Um, and then the aim is that after November 2023, when my project ends and the Cumbrian Creel project in its kind of formal and funded stage ends, these fishermen will be able to continue this as part of their business and be able to have uh, an income which is both economically and environmentally sustainable and really great um, for the local community. Harry, I'm going to hand over to you for how people can get involved. How can you eat more sustainable seafood? Well, to start with, you choose sustainable seafood. Um, you can speak to your local fishmonger and ask for fish that have been caught through selective methods. Um, methods like creeling, like we've been speaking about, pole and line fishing, or hand diving methods. All of these have low levels of bycatch and they don't damage uh, marine habitats, which is really, really important and something that we're really trying to promote. Um, you can support your local fishing industry. And to do that, you can support um, local restaurants that stock local fish 
Uh, you can use local suppliers who are in contact with the fishermen and um, just asking the questions about where the where the fish is coming from that you're eating uh, is probably the main way. And I think finally, um, tell your friends and family about sustainable fishing. Tell everyone that you know that sustainable fishing is an option because we need more people to be aware of that and we need to, more people to be aware that sustainable fishing exists. Um, we need more people choosing sustainable fish over more destructive methods. Um, yeah, we just need more awareness. Um, this kind of fishing isn't bad. Um, obviously, there's large scale fishing, but we're really talking about small scale fishing that supports local businesses, local economies. Um, yeah. So, yeah, get the word out to everybody. And I'll hand back over to Lucy now. So I'll just finish with um, a few resources for where you can go to find out more. Um, so the Cumbrian Creel Project has a web page on the Living Seas Northwest website and there you can find all of the kind of reports from the pilot project, all of the plans for the future of the project and a bit more of an explanation of the kind of how and why of creel fishing and how that can help marine life. My Local Catch also has um, a web page on the Living Seas Northwest website. Um, and if you follow Living Seas Northwest on any of our social media channels, then we're also running a series of Fishy Friday posts, which also help to kind of disseminate some of those um, issues around marine um, conservation and sustainable fishing and how those two kind of link together. Um, and My Local Catch is also running loads of different events which you can get involved in. So if you enjoyed this webinar, we're running a sort of partner webinar next Tuesday, um, which we'll be diving into what Cumbria sustainable seafood is, what it looks like, how we can cook it, how we can source it, some suggested recipes. And for this, it won't just be about langoustine. We'll be going into kind of some of the other fish caught by selective methods in our local area and how you can source it. So things like crab or bass or um, lobster and sort of how you can go about cooking them, how they can be a part of an affordable and really healthy diet um, and very environmentally sustainable diet. Um, in terms of in-person events, we have a rock pooling and wildlife survey on at Parton Bay on Thursday this week. So we'll be there from nine until one and we'll be running guided rock pooling, we'll be running self-guided kind of spotter activities for anyone who just wants to go off exploring themselves. And then we'll be running something called a shore search survey, which is a really important way of monitoring the wildlife in our rocky coast and seeing if how it's doing, if there's any kind of trends in its population that we need to be aware of. And then on Saturday this week, there is the Festival of the Sea at St Bees, which is an all-day super fun family festival for everyone um it'll have kind of sports and beach games it'll have wildlife watching like rock pooling and strandline searches and bird watches and even some dolphin watches um which if our event last week is anything to go by there may even be some dolphins to see on the surveys um and yeah there'll also be seafood tasters there arts and crafts all kinds of other activities for anyone of any age to get involved in um, and it would be absolutely brilliant to see some of you there. So, yeah, if you'd like to find out more, I'll leave this page up as we answer a few questions. Um, so you're very welcome to head to any of those resources. Got a question for you, Harry, if you're happy with it. Lynn has asked how long the pots are out for and how many times a week the fishermen go out. Do you want to answer that one? That's a good question. It's not a question that... I fully know. I mean, um, if we had Emily here, she'd be able to tell you. But um, yeah, I'm not 100% sure. I know they're left out for a few days. I don't know how many pots they have. I think we have a few hundred pots, don't we, for the whole project? Yeah, so we have, um, I think, around 50 to 100 from the pilot phase and then around 400, which we'll be buying. Um, and usually they get put out for a few days and there'll be kind of a few different places where fishermen have pots and they'll go out most days and collect stuff. So they'll never be out for more than a couple of days and there's plenty of space within those pots so that the creatures inside don't come to any harm in that time. 
Um, just to answer Lynn's other question, she asks, we only have three fishermen, are they all living in Whitehaven? Uh, so the reason there's just three is so that we can actually really support those fishermen rather than kind of spreading our resources so wide that all you end up doing is giving people some pots. We want to really help those fishermen to develop their business strategy, develop their fishing methods and actually support them through it. Um, so we have one fisherman in Whitehaven and two in Barrow. Um, and the reason that it's kind of shifted towards Barrow is because the west of Warnley conservation zone where we're doing the fishing is down that way. Um, and the hope is that in the future there might be another project area in um, further north near Whitehaven. Um, but it's just we haven't yet been able to get the permissions um, from the local fishing community to kind of do that. So initially it's in west of Warnley. And then there may be potential in the future to expand it if the fishing community are on board. Um, Harry, do mm -hmm. you know much about scallop fishing, hand diving, that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. So Is this, yeah. Adrian asks, um, you mentioned scallops are doing well in Lime Bay. How can yeah. they be caught without trawling? Yeah, so obviously trawling is the main way to catch scallops, but it is quite destructive. Um, scallops are using five to twenty meter depths of water, so people free dive for scallops. Uh, it's a it's a way that um, people used to catch scallops, and some people still do it to this day. So obviously you need clear water to see where you're going. So Irish Sea is a bit more difficult, but in Lime Bay that's what they've been doing there. So yeah, sustainably caught scallops yeah it's a big thing in many conservation zones around the country i know if you go to the isle of Arran, you can get hand dived scallops and i'm sure they taste better for it <laughs> um christine asks are the maryport fishermen involved in the pro project since brexit they're selling fish mainly langoustine at the harbour side um which is very popular locally so yeah um we're aware of these um, fishermen in Maryport. It's really great to see, you know, more local catch being returned to the local area. Um, and actually, because our project scope was kind of defined pre-Brexit, we aren't working with those fishermen specifically. Um, also, because a large amount of their catch is trawled, we're not working directly with them because we really want to develop creole fishing as um, the better method of catching langoustine. Um, however, in the future, once we've had a kind of creole season for learning um, the best methods, we'll be doing knowledge sharing events with the fishing industry all across the coast of Cumbria and Morecambe area. Um, and we would really, really love to work with the Maryport fishermen as well there to kind of help them um, have sort of environmentally sustainable methods too. Um, Harry, could you just clarify for Chris, I think one of our statistics on the creel catching versus trawling bycatch, um, Chris just asks um, to clarify the 25% by weight was for trawling. Um, and do you want to explain a little bit more the kind of the difference there? Yeah, so it wasn't quite clear on the, I think we put it on the slide, but um, so when you're trawling for nephrops, you have a 25% bycatch. So if you caught 100 kilograms of net props, you'd have um, 25 kilograms bycatch. And um, that is a lot. That's a quarter of your catch. Um, and that's really not good. And the bycatch can't usually be returned alive if it's through trawling, because most of the time, if you're trawling, uh, it it kills the animals because of the you, you're cramming so much into one area and also you're dragging the... Um, the the net across the sea floor which is destructive to the to the animals so a lot of the time they they die in the process which which means that the bycatch is thrown back uh, dead basically i'm just going to um go to Rhoda's question so um they ask are there any issues with creel fishing and subsequent ghost fishing or is this more possible to avoid with small scale fishing? Um, so the issue Rhoda is talking about here is basically when you have pots which have become lost and wildlife gets stuck in it and then is unable to escape and ends up kind of getting dying tangled in this gear. 
Um, and that is a really big issue with loads of different types of um, fishing gear. Um, it's a big issue with kind of nets and trawling things as well because they get tangled on things, they break, they escape. But it's also an issue um, with pots. And the key thing here is when you're doing it at a small scale, it's much easier to kind of keep track of each fisherman knows where the pots are and knows what they're going back to get. And they're not just going to leave them hanging about because that's a very valuable asset that they can't afford to just lose. Um, so with small scale fishing, it's much easier to avoid. And the way you avoid it is just by going back and regularly checking on your pots to make sure nothing's stuck in there and that you're taking out everything and either re-releasing it or, or bring it, landing it as catch. Um, the other um, reason that it's kind of a bit better on this way for that is the way that a lot of pots usually get lost is when they get kind of churned up by trawlers. Um, they can also get lost in really stormy weather and for you know a range of other factors. But by doing this creeling in an area where there's definitely no trawling, um, you sort of reduce the risk of that as well. I think that may be all of our questions. If anyone has any other questions um, to add, then they'd be very, very welcome. Um, but if not, thank you all so much for joining us. And it would be lovely to see some of you either on the webinar next week or at some of our events or just at future activities with Cumbria Wildlife Trust. We'll leave um, the question box open for a couple more minutes and then we'll sign off and wish you all a lovely evening. Thanks very much everyone.